Floyd, we want to welcome you and thank you for participating in this project. We'll start off by having you uh, give us your name, full name, and spell it so that we have it correct on the tape. My name is Floyd H. Clark, F-L-O-Y-D-C-L-A-R-K. Good. Thank you. Let's start with your high school and the war that was going on and or was you'll tell us about that and then move into you said you had some college and then we'll move into your military service I went to high school in Burdick Kansas that's in Morris County uh, I graduated there in 1940 I went uh, two years Kansas State University uh, then they drafted me into the Army in February of 1922, no, February 22nd, 1943. And uh, where do we go from there? Well, uh, did you do any, uh, any military, uh, anything at, while at Kansas State? I uh, took ROTC at Kansas State, took two years of it. Now, let's see, did you go directly into the service from KSU, or did you go back to your home? I went back to my home and went to work on the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad uh, on a bridge gang. And uh, when I was had to go to be drafted, why the company wanted me to go, wanted the uh, government, or whoever it was, to put me in the Santa Fe Railroad Battalion, which was operating in Africa at the time, and they put my um, job description as a bridge and building mechanics helper. Uh, nobody knew what bridge and building was, they just seen mechanic helper, and I ended up in a mechanized outfit. Okay. Well, that's interesting about that uh, project that they had there in Africa. I didn't know about that. Okay, so then you were uh, drafted. Right. And so pick up from there and tell us where you went and your basic. And I was drafted yeah, from Morris County. I left Council Grove and to Leavenworth. And I was processed there and sent on the train to Camp Camel, Kentucky. Back in those days, now it's Fort Camel and took my basic training there. I thought my ROTC would training would help get me a little higher ranking, but I ended up as a private. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, then from there, we went on a train to, uh, I, if I remember correctly, it was, uh, hmm. Newport News, what what state? Rhode Island, isn't it? No, it's done. Virginia. Virginia, I think. <laughs> and uh, we left there August, uh, sometime in August, late August, in a convoy of many, many ships. And of course the convoy could only travel the speed of the slowest vehicle, which was the top speed, which was six miles an hour, so it took us 21 days to go across. Do you remember, did you uh, stop at any uh, port on the way from Newport News until you got across? Did you? No. You no. went straight across? Straight to Oran, Africa. Oran, Africa. Okay. Uh, do you want to tell us anything about that, uh, uh, those 21 days? Uh, well, I, on that trip, I learned not to gamble. <laughs> they talked me into playing blackjack on top deck, and I had 64 cents, I believe it was, in my pocket, and we played penny ante. And uh, <laughs> I made up to $2.47 that day, so I was anxious to go the next day. 
Well, I lost that two hundred forty-seven dollars, my six or two hundred forty-seven, two dollars and forty-seven cents, and plus my sixty-four cents. I've never gambled since. Is that right? Some weren't that lucky. Tell us that lost. Someone, one of the veterans, told us somebody lost their farm. I, mean. <laughs> I remember on a trip over. I uh, had a submarine alert. And it was right, right at meal time, and I had my meal and, and my mess kit and sitting on my bunk, which was a hammock. And uh, that sounded, and of course, you put your plate down and went top side. I put my plate back underneath uh, my bunk. When I come back, there was a footprint in it. <laughs> I could tell you some other things about that trip, but there. They're not very good to travel. <laughs> well, you be the uh, judge on whether you want to tell them. <clears throat> and I know, don't know what my limit is. <laughs> <laughs> the, t the tape is for you. <laughs> well, then I better not say it. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, you don't want anything on here. You don't want your grandchildren. Okay. To see. So you got over to Oran, Africa. And they put me in a what they call a repel depot. That's a replacement depot. And I, we spent a couple of weeks there, and, uh, and then they put us on a train, uh, one of those 40 and 8 trains, and we rode over to Tunisia. And uh, on the way, I had a half a dollar in my pocket, and, and I picked up a spike, and I'd pound on that outside edge of that half a dollar and it just flared out like a ring and then I dug the inside out. I don't remember how many days it was going across there but I could only pound just a little bit and then it drained move a mile or two and I'd have to pound again. I meant to bring that ring with me but I didn't. And uh, I, we spent a while there in replacement depot in Tunisia and I was assigned to General Eisenhower's headquarters guard. His headquarters was in uh, Algeria at that time and uh, then after about two months why they moved him from Africa to England and uh, uh, then they... Now, now could you tell us about what you did here? Did you see General Eisenhower? Was he around? Did you see him? I personally never saw him because he was, uh, I don't know where he was, mm -hmm. but uh, I know that uh, he would take a platoon or a troop with him when he went anywhere, and I never got had the privilege to go with him on any trips. He'd go to the front line while he'd take some of our, our troops with him. You would guard the gate, or what was your role there then? Well, we was just stationed there, and whenever he needed to, I suppose uh, I never pulled guard duty around his headquarters or anything, but uh, I'm sure that some were there. And after uh, enough. No, yes, that, and then he moved, and so then you got it. Yeah, and then uh, if you remember, um, uh, Churchill got pneumonia, and they sent him down to Marrakesh. Uh, I don't remember, Morocco, I believe, is the name of the country. And um, we had to guard him while he was recuperating. We was there about, I don't know, six weeks, something like that. And we pulled guard duty out in the countries. And I learned how to say, do you have any eggs in Arabic at that place? <laughs> and then we they took us back to Oran, Africa. And... Uh, about the same place that we were before, and took training to go to the front line. What weapons did you have? Well, at that time I was a jeep driver. Okay. And I carried the Thompson submachine gun. And is that, did you keep that weapon? You're, or you're going to tell us maybe more later about well, the front line and 
I kept, yes. I kept that, uh, as long as I was a truck driver, I'm a Jeep driver, mm -hmm. well, that was my assigned weapon. And we landed in Naples, Italy, and uh, we got there just at the time that they broke uh, away from C Casino Hill. Mm -hmm. And so the, they, push, they had us pushing the Germans back up Italy. We pushed them through Rome and up to a little town. Well, I don't know how little it was. Uh, Leghorn was the name of it, as we knew it anyhow. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they pulled us out of the line and brought us back down to uh, Naples. And uh, we prepared for the invasion of southern France. Cause Moline, our vehicles all up. I believe at that time I was promoted to PFC. I may have been promoted promoted in uh, Africa, and then I got to be corporal. I guess it was in in Italy. Then we went on the southern invasion of France, and I was landed on shore at eight. I believe it was eight forty-five, about forty-five minutes after the first bombardment and uh, we unloaded from the LSTs, uh, didn't even get my wheels wet. And then we had to take all that Cosmoline off and 2.30 that next morning why they sent us out for a little town. I'm not sure whether they call it Lyons or Lyon, but whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, we had to set up outposts there to intercept uh, German Panzer Division that was coming up from the Spanish border. They were retreating. And uh, my job was as being in charge of a, a squad. We, I had a, three Jeeps and an armored car. And uh, we were told to knock out the first three vehicles and then leave. And this we did. We knocked out. They they, they uh, played right into our hands. They sent three little vehicles like, like similar to our Jeeps and then they sent a, an armored vehicle of some kind and our armored vehicle knocked out their armored vehicle and the Jeeps took care of the first three and we left and air, airplane, Air Force come in and uh, strafed the column and I don't know how much damage was done, but that that was a, the end of that com campaign as far as we were concerned. They backed this up and I, they sent us down to a little town by the name of Gap, France, which was a resort town up in the, in the uh, Alps on the border of Switzerland. And I don't know why they sent us down there, but we got surrounded. There was uh, Germans on the other side of the hill, and then there's Germans coming in on the back side of us. But prior to that, before we got the gap, we was traveling down this highway, and uh, uh, the French Marquis uh, stopped us about 10 miles out of the side of a town. I don't remember the town and said there was 1,900 German soldiers that piled all their armor, guns, and what have you in the middle of the street, and they wanted to give up. So uh, we called back to headquarters, and they said they'd send some trucks out, and they did. Sent some uh, six-by-sixes out there and loaded all them up, <laughs> sent them, took them back on the other side of the line. We was, I suppose, 30 miles from out in front of our lines at that time. And then we left Gap and we went up into uh, well, the north central part of and probably a little east in France. Uh, and some of the names of towns was Ramble of Ramble Valiers or something like that. And Bro um, Brew was one of them, and we just kind of uh, holding line 
there. We wouldn't doubt doing reconnaissance work anymore. And they took, at, I believe it was at Brew, they had this, uh, well, they wanted to find out about a German anti-tank uh, position. So they lined us up, and our troop was picked to lead the pack, and we started down the road towards the, the objective. <laughs> and he let us get close enough that he had about 12 vehicles he could start shooting at, and he knocked out a, a light tank, that's all we had, a light tank, knocked it out, and then he hit the, the armored car in the front, and then started uh, peeling out the rest of us. And, uh, last I seen my Jeep, it was, uh, and I, I was a corporal, and I did, wasn't driving, and that thing just jumped up, and last we seen was smoke and fire, and we run back to the little town of Brew, where we were stationed. And, uh, you had jumped out of the Jeep before? Yeah, before the <clears throat> bullet hit it. Mm -hmm. We was waiting on orders to see what they wanted us to do, and we figured it would be a target setting in there. Sure enough, it, it was a target. <clears throat> From there, they took us up to another little town, I can't think it is, that's on the edge of the Rhine River. And uh, our troop was supposed to uh, patrol the Rhine in a duck. And uh, my the sergeants, Staff sergeants and uh, lieutenant, second lieutenants all got in my Jeep. Well, not my Jeep only, it was three Jeeps. And they went down underneath a railroad crossing and her trellis and they hit landmines. And uh, uh, we lost all those officers and staff sergeants. And, and uh, I was. Uh, Corporal and I was the only one highest ranking man in our platoon after that. And uh, so they put me in charge of, have a, of an outpost there. And uh, we captured one German on the night patrol. And uh, we told him to halt, but he didn't. He did halt, but just long enough to get up enough ambition to run, I guess. <laughs> and we got him. We missed the other. Four, I think it was. And then, after that episode, up, I think, we were putting those ducks out, and we went up. Well, I think it was about the time that the uh, bulge up in Belgium had it had failed, and uh, they moved us in up to where they thought the Germans were going to try another push us around. Oh, east of Bitchy, France. Uh, well, it was at Bitchy, France, but it was east of Metz, about 30 miles, I would guess. And uh, we were in reserve at that point. Going back just a little bit, Floyd, uh, I'm interested in this was all just happening, and you didn't really know where the enemy was, and they didn't know where you were. That's what I'm kind of visualizing, because you saw these Germans on night patrol. Well, they were on the other side of the river, on the other side of the Rhine. Okay. So and you they, shot across? No, they boated across and run a patrol up, I suppose, to test and see where we were at. Okay. They found out. So they were just kind of trying to find out where you were. And mm -hmm. They were in a stationary situation too, and mm -hmm. they just run their test patrols over to check and see if we was around. And and back to a little bit more information on when you lost your officers with the landmines. Um, any more to that story, or as you look back on it, or? Well, I wasn't there, of course. Uh, I just know that we lost all our men and it made our captain 
the troop commander, um, pretty disheartened. And uh, I thought he'd done some things that probably shouldn't have done. I think it. Uh, I think he found a wine bottle or two, and he made some bad decisions. I thought after that, but I suppose because he lost all those officers and sergeants, that it would upset you a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, I kind of uh, in interrupted you as you were moving That's on, right. so go ahead, pick up your story. Okay, uh, while well, we were well, we were in reserve there, and uh, we got called up. The, 14th Army was ahead of us, and uh, we was backing them up, and uh, they'd sent the 1st platoon and the 3rd platoon up on the line, and I was in the 2nd platoon, and we were in backing them up. And if they needed, either one of them needed help while we was back there to help them. And uh, we hadn't heard anything from the 1st platoon for quite some time, and you know, my staff sergeant uh, told me to take my Jeep and go up and, and uh, see where they was at and what the trouble was. So they took my good machine gun off, put it on the armored car, and they took their burnt out one and put on my Jeep, and uh, we started down to find them. First platoon, they were, it was a, a, a road run into a Y situation you come from the uh, southwest and you went northeast, and then there's one coming from the southeast going northeast, northwest, and they met going in one road going north. And uh, we got to that intersection and bullets was flying all around us. I mean from every direction. And uh, I got hit in the left thigh and the right ankle. My driver got hit in the left uh, shoulder and the left buttocks. And my gunner was sitting up there with a no good gun. He didn't get a bullet. <laughs> and we, of course, jumped out into the ditch. And I, it was snow on the ground and you could see every movement you made. And uh, uh, we took all our be uh, guns and stuff that we had, and I had a, we had a German burp gun and uh, a Luger and a P-38, and of course uh, I was carrying an M1 at that time, since I was corporal, and uh, we threw them as far as we could throw them in down into the creek and the timber, and uh, looked up and I seen. First platoon on that road going south and east. So I reached up my radio and called a staff sergeant and told him that the first platoon was to my right on the road back to whatever little town that went to. We that's where we had spent the night before. And uh, I said they're walking up the hill with their hands behind their head, and I said, I see nothing else for us to do but the same thing, and uh, that's the last communication I heard from, and we walked up the hill, and I'd forgot I had a Italian pistol in my uh, back, and uh, got up there, and they started searching us, as they're supposed to do, and he found that, and he, he had a rifle, uh, and he poked me in the stomach. And I swear it hit my backbone because it was, he pushed it hard. And they walked us to a little house about, oh, I'm going to say about two miles from the front line. And I had took my uh, first aid kit, doctored my, my left uh, thigh. I didn't even know about the, the right one, the right ankle, didn't know it had hurt. And uh, we was in that little house a while and I don't know, several hours. And uh, I believe it was the next night they took us into a pillbox on the national line and took us down there with a whole bunch of German soldiers. 
and uh, it was the next morning. They had an ambulance there and took took us to uh, a makeshift hospital in uh, New Stadt News. Uh, I suppose it's Germany. I'm not. It might have been Alsace Lorraine. I don't know where it's at. And. Uh, put us up on the third floor in an empty room, no beds, no nothing. And that was our home from then until March about the 19th. And uh, we tried to help those that were um, hurt real bad. There's one fellow was uh, in a tank and it was on fire and they, they got him out of it. And he's just, uh, I don't know, I suppose 85% uh, burnt, and we doctored him as best we could. We, they, they never give us any medicine. All they give us was uh, uh, crepe paper, white crepe paper, to wrap wounds with. And I don't know. We didn't have much to do with to help him, but we tried. And uh, I believe he survived the ordeal, if I remember right. And. Uh, March, they took the Americans was getting too close to us. Why they loaded us up and took us to a little town by the name of Heppenheim, which is in early days was a insane asylum for Germans, and they converted it to a POW hospital, and that's where we ended up. And the uh, we were there. I was there about two weeks. And the backyard, a little small yard, had green grass and dandelions like our yards have now. And uh, uh, they give those of us that could get around, we had the liberty to go outside. And uh, in that two weeks, that green grass and dandelions ended up pure dirt. <laughs> we ate it all. We didn't get much to eat. We got a um, little slice of. Uh, we called it sawdust bread. It was black bread. Uh, tasted like what I think sawdust. Uh, bread made out of sawdust would taste like. It wasn't very tasty. And they brought us a cup of coffee, and I swear they went to uh, a pencil sharpener and took those little seed leavings and made coffee with them. And uh, then they, after that, they put us on a or walk, started walking us and walked to 18 of us in that hospital was able to walk. We started out with 18 and uh, heading for somewhere. We didn't know where. We was in uh, a line. There was some Germans and Serbs and I don't know, all kinds of POWs. And of course, uh, Americans are always the people that everybody has to tear down and run over and try to, and, and the German soldiers had all their suitcases and clothing and stuff like that in a, a horse wagon, box wagon, and they assigned us 18 Americans to pull and push that down the road. Well, that, that's what we did. We got to a little town, I don't know what town, but uh, the uh, Russians had uh, found a horse alongside the road that the, they figured that the Americans' airplanes had strafed and killed, and they butchered that horse, and they cooked it all day long. We just traveled at night, and they cooked that all day long. And when it come time to go, I, they, the Germans, or the Russians asked us if they could put their horse on that wagon. And they said if they did, why well, they'd pull it. And we agreed to push. <laughs> of course, we had that horse in mind. We, they had a sheet, I don't know where they got the sheet, but a sheet over it and under it. And we reached up there and grabbed a bunch of meat and we ate horse for two hours. We was pretty hungry. And, uh, about midnight, we got so sick, all of us, 18 of us, 
we was all eating that horse meat. Well, the only thing we figured probably wasn't killed yesterday. It was probably killed a week ago, and uh, give us all tomain poisoning. And five of us uh, was able to kick the poisoning, and the other thirteen they took to the hospital. I don't know their outcome, but we they sent us on with them. And uh, on April the 1st, or thereabouts, we was in a little town and they heisted us out just a little bit early that time, for some reason or other. We found out later, we could look across the valley and our tanks was sitting there shooting. We knew we was right close to the line again. And uh, we uh, was going, we went about about a mile, I'd say, maybe two miles, and uh, Mother Nature called me, and I slipped over to by a tree, and uh, then they took the uh, convoy, started them up when I wasn't ready yet, and uh, so my buddy had told me, he says, if you ever decide to try to make a uh, run for it, why, I want to go with you. Well, I wanted to honor that, so I run up there and caught them. And I told him, I said, now next time they stop, I said, we'll just slip over into the trees here and act like we have to go. And so, uh, you know, they never stopped the rest of the night. Mm -hmm. We ended up, I don't know how many miles away from where I could have, we could have found the line real quick. And we, at that place, why, him and I hid under a haystack uh, through the day. Well, not through the day, we prepared it all day long, and then just about an hour before they leave, why, we crawled in it and hid, and, and there was a big, tall Kentuckian with us. And uh, him and the other two went down and got in the Call them to go, and they asked where the other two Americans were, and uh, nobody said anything. Finally, the Kentuckian said he knew where they were. And they come up, and they rousted us out, and we had to get back in the line. And uh, I made, or we made, three more attempts after that, and <laughs> get caught every time. But we never suffered any consequences from it. A lot of them times, you know, they. Mm -hmm treat you wrong, I guess, but they didn't, uh, they just made us get back in line, which we were pretty fortunate. We ended up in uh, Mooseburg uh, POW camp, Sidelog 7A, this, which is near uh, Munich. And we got Red Cross partials there. I think I got two while I was there, and we had to share them with everybody. And uh, the day that we were uh, released, you're trying to think of the right word, but anyhow, the uh, day before, we, oh no, it was that day, we saw tanks all around our camp pointed in. And uh, the chief come up to the gate and they opened it up and uh, liberated us right there, and and uh, that next day we had to stay in the camp. And the next day, I remember the the uh, kitchen truck came in and they baked some white bread. Oh, I ain't never tasted cake that tasted any better. <laughs> and then uh, uh, I don't know, three days later, I guess why. They hauled us over to uh, a little town. Well, it didn't, wasn't a little town. It was a pretty good-sized town. It had an airport. Took us over there, and then they was flying us from there to Reims, France. And uh, uh, I remember there was a German fighter plane come flying in, and... Uh, all the soldiers that was guarding that area, 
had their guns and they were just shooting with their rifles, trying to knock him down. Well, he landed and uh, pulled over there and shut off his motor and stood up and held his hands up. And, and he was tired of the war, he said, <laughs> getting out. And uh, that sure scared us on the ground. We was all figuring he was going to just stray for the whole bunch of us. But he, he was wanting to give up. He just wanted to land and get it over with. And they, when we got on the plane, then the troop plane uh, took us to Reims, Reims, France, and there we got to take a good bath, and they give us all new clothes and and uh, covered with uh, covered us or give us uh, oh it's powder. What is it? Ain't two four D, is it? DDT, that's it, it is. And we had lice yeah, from the time we got in the German control till we were liberated and then at Reims, France, we had lice. And I mean, you just spent hours of picking them off of you and they'd be just that many the next day. So no one took us from there. They was on a uh, troop train, hospital train, from there to Camp Lucky Strike, which is near La Harve. And uh, there we waited until I had a ship ready for us. We got another LA, uh, wasn't an LSD, it was a Liberty ship. And uh, it took us 13 days to come home and on it. And I looked down once and the propeller was half out of the water, so it was pretty empty. And uh, when they got to the place where the Titanic sunk, why well, they let us know. They said that we're right over the spot where the Titanic was sunk. And uh, it looked just like any other place, just water. <laughs> we landed and went right by the Statue of Liberty and landed at uh, is it Fort Dix? I believe it's Fort Dix. Did you stop any place coming back? Like when after you saw the Titanic, did you stop? In Canada, no, any? No. Not at Halifax. No. no. Right straight through. Okay. Two days we was on a troop train heading for the west, and uh, I ended up back at Fort Riley, or at uh, Fort Leavenworth. And I was there about a day, and they sent me to home for 90 days. And then they and then I had to go to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, to re, what do they call it, re, can't think. I went through a lot of exam, physical, medical checks and so forth, and worked on my teeth. And then they went to Fort Riley, sent me up there. And I was in the cavalry training school. And until I got my discharge. And what was that date? October 15th, 1945. How did the war change you? How did all this experience change you, do you think? Well, I really don't know other than to say that I had enough of this traveling around over the country and away from everybody and all my relatives and friends and I wanted to settle down and have a family. I didn't even want to come back to college and I didn't and of course I've kicked myself several times since I got back, didn't do that. And, uh, I wanted to be a automobile mechanic I thought, but uh, after working a year well, on automobiles and garages, learning the trade, why a guy come up to me and wanted to know if I wanted to be a, want to take some electrician's training. And I said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, I can get you a certain amount of money, I don't know, twice as much as I was making, and I can get you a, a GI training, mm -hmm. and you'll get about twice as much money an hour. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm for that. <laughs> So I quit being a 
an automobile kid to be a mechanic and went to be an electrician and learned the trade and ended up and nine years later at Kansas State University. Worked there for five years and then got promoted to electrical supervisor. Spent the rest of my years there. I believe you brought along some things to show us. We might, uh, that we can zoom in with the camera and see what you have, Floyd. All right. Well, we'll try to go in the same order. Okay. When I was in Africa, I bought two of these um, wallets. I got one for my dad, one for me. I, this is the one I got for me. me. And uh, I, uh, now I got them both. Of course, my father's dead. When I was in France, a place we stayed overnight, I found this laying there. It's a cigarette case. It's got the uh, Arc of Triumph on it. It's uh, pretty thin cigarette, looks to me like. It opened up like that. And when I was a POW, I made that. This is a piece of uh, blade off a sawmill where, uh, I mean, a electric saw, mm -hmm. metal saw. Uh, the but the uh, privates had to go and work in these factories, and they brought a piece of that back, and, and uh, I don't remember how I sharpened that up, probably just an old stone there. And I cut me a stick and I wrapped it up with that. And, that's, and I wore it in my boot like that. Now, I don't know how I got by with it, but I did. And in my travel for I took that. I uh, took that off of a soldier in the Herman Goring Division, over that tank outfit. Mm -hmm. I also got this. That's a, um, there's a SWAT sticker back here. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, what do you call that? Compass? Compass, yeah, compass, German compass. Turn it around here and get a good picture of the, of the swastika and the eagle. Okay. And these were my medals that I was issued. To this is the, the one I'm the most proud of. That's my Bronze Star Medal. Mm -hmm. uh, and I well, let's come off of there. That's my bronze, uh, my Purple Heart Medal. And. This is the European Theater of Operation medal. It's got three bronze stars up there. It's, uh, service in Africa, and Italy, and France, and Rhineland. And this is my POW. Those are the ones that I got issued, but I wasn't. I got out before we give the victory sta uh, victory medal, and I've got that order. And uh, let's see, one other one I got ordered. I think what it is right now. <clears throat> I had a lot of other stuff there. I got my POW uh, dog tags. I couldn't find them this morning. So I brought these. This is a year ago last April I got a letter from the French consulate that uh, requested my presence in Independence, Camp, uh, Missouri at uh, Truman Library. They wanted to give me something and this is what they give me. Just a little straight up and down. 
and uh, that's uh, it says diploma, but it means certificate. Appreciation of of uh, helping to liberate France, 1944 to 1945. This one I got just last month. That's. Uh, my county, this happens to be Lincoln County, where I come back to when I got out of the Army. Uh, it's a Purple Heart. Uh, they honored the Purple Heart recipients in, the, in our county. And this is what they give me. And it's got the two Purple Heart stamps there in the bottom. And uh, I was pretty honored, to, I thought, to get, get to have that. My kids was all there to watch me get that. Have you, <clears throat> have you changed any, Floyd, on your willingness to tell your story? Your story is so gripping and, and so dramatic. Have you, were you reluctant when you first came back to tell all that? Or well, you... I said to myself when I came back that I wouldn't tell anything of that would that was real bad I tell all the happy things and uh, I wasn't afraid to tell that and I knew it wouldn't bring out any tears to tell that but I didn't know what might happen if I start telling some of the the bad parts that I had seen mm -hmm. there was one town in France that we took and the name of it was Neuf Maisons. I remember that easy. It means nine houses in France. And uh, we took that town with, I think it, we used uh, five uh, detectors, mine detectors, and swept the road. We removed the, the uh, mines, and we took, that's how we took that town. <laughs> <laughs> the funny, funny part there was we, we was there, got there just that night, seven o'clock somewhere in there, just dusk, and it was getting pretty dark, and uh, we bunked down in a, the barn, hay, hay and uh, where they had hay. Got up next morning, and two German soldiers was bunked down there too with us. <laughs> they were there before we got there. They were just as happy to see us as they could be. The war was over for them. That's the kind of things I like to tell, the, the happy things. Well, you uh, actually saw some compassion by the Germans to you. Mm -hmm. in, uh, they didn't have much to give, but they were pretty generous in a sense. And, in um, giving you your life, so to speak. That's right. They, they had you, so they could have done the opposite. Yep, they could have. Uh, just two weeks before I was captured, they uh, captured a lot of them up in Belgium, and they just lined them up and shot them. And that's what we were expecting when uh, when we were captured, that we'd just be lined up. And that'd be the end of it, but fortunately they, we didn't. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to be sure and get on this tape? Well, I think we've pretty well covered it all. There's probably a lot of little little things in between that I might say that uh, I, on my left ankle, I took that uh, shrapnel out by myself. I didn't have no doctors, no medicine, no nothing. It just festered up, and I caught it with a piece of that crepe paper stuff they got, and uh, so I dug it out. With my well, I don't know what I had. I usually carried a knife, but anyhow, I got it dug out, and it healed right up. No, no complications. That's good. And there was uh, another little town uh, place that. We stopped one night early for some reason or other, and all that was there was it was out in the middle of a field, and there was a building 
about the size of this room, I would say, and, and there was all of us people in that uh, uh, POW line. They made us go in there and sleep, but we had to sit down, and everybody sat in each other's lap, clear to the front door. And you don't think you can sleep setting up, but you can. <laughs> I did. <laughs> you have these uh, towns and cities and locations so well in mind. Have you been back? Do you ever want to go back? I'd like to go back, and but it costs too much money. Uh, Three dollars a person, of course. That means six. I mean, three thousand dollars a person at this one time that I inquired, and that'd be six thousand dollars. And I don't have that kind of money, so I didn't get to go. Um, but uh, I've written down all of the names of all those towns I went through in our POW march. Well, thank you. It's been a nice, uh, been nice of you to share this, and I know your story is going to be appreciated. I, uh, if I, uh, I've got another frame that I'm going to put my medals in, mm -hmm. and uh, they haven't got here yet, and I've got the frame, but I haven't got the medals. I didn't get to bring that to show that. I enjoy showing this stuff because everybody likes it and yes. likes to see it. It'll probably be on my wall in the house someday, all of the stuff in a certain area. Hope so. I, I hope that this uh, interview was up to expectations. And it was. You have, you have quite a story. Thank you for uh, doing that during the wartime, and uh, thank you for coming today. You bet. So now